Welcome to On the Line. I'm Christian Williams coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints Hour. Afrocentric schools proposed in Toronto. Impaired driving charges dropped because a Spanish man didn't have an interpreter present when stopped by the cops. Stay tuned. And these are the issues we're presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. The Toronto School Board will vote soon on the proposal for Afrocentric schools. A judge has dismissed an impaired driving charge against a Spanish-speaking immigrant because there wasn't an interpreter present when police stopped him. And the Canadian Border Services Agency forced to back down from deporting a disabled Sikh man who sought sanctuary in a Sikh temple. Now let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Paul McKeever is leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario. And Dr. Anthony Hutchinson is executive director of the Brampton Neighbourhood Resource Centre. You, the viewer, are our third guest. Feel free to call in at any time with your comments on any of the subject matters that we're discussing today. Now that brings us to the first subject matter. It's been in the news for some time. They're talking about it. It's made headlines. Afrocentric schools in Toronto. There you go. Board trustees, mall proposal for black school. Well, it's coming up shortly. Apparently the vote's supposed to be January the 30th, so it's around the corner. Now, to make a long story short, these are the basic basic size of the issue. Proponents for it are saying, well, it's a great alternative because when you look at the dropout rate, um, we're talking people of African heritage here. We talked about this, Anthony, who are they referring to here? Afrocentric schools. The focus is on black education. Once again, a huge dropout rate in the black community. So this is hope that if you have this type of a school, you're going to end up with more graduates. In fact, it's being modeled. In fact, the States has it. So we're kind of modeling after them. And from what this article says, you've got a high success rate. That's one component to consider. But opponents are saying, wow, it brings us back to that day of segregation. We want to know what your opinion is on it. Are you rooting for Afrocentric schools or aren't you? We're going to talk to our guests to find out where they stand on the issue. Paul, I'm going to start with you first on this one. Well, you know, I'm not comfortable at all with, well, first of all, even tax-funded schooling, because I think it takes mm -hmm. choice away from parents to begin with. But uh, my concern is, is with any kind of school that says, and, and I think the curriculum and the, and the idea in the school is to say, let's surround children or uh, teens, depending on the school, with um, cultural artifacts and pepper the, the uh, curriculum with heritage notes and history and et cetera. The problem with that is that students aren't being taught to mm -hmm. think uh, first and foremost, but rather just to learn a list of how uh, other, you know, other ways of living. And, you know, the suggestion is, well, here are some examples of, of black people who have been successful. You can be successful too. Aren't they a great role model? The problem is that a person's skin color is no gauge of your own personal success, uh, whatever your skin color is. Uh, just because someone in the past happened to have been smart and, and do something great, or was a murderer and did something horrible doesn't mean that you're going to be great or you're going to be horrible. And I think when we set culture and tradition and history as the means by which we're teaching children things, we're getting away from just teaching them how to use their own mind and think independently. Break mm -hmm. away from tradition and, and look to the future, not to the past. Now, based on what you're saying here, because I want you to go over that maybe a little bit in more depth from the point of view of what the argument is here based on what's being taught in the schools, European history, yeah. instead of the holistic approach to history. There are other races. There's Asian history. There's African history, as well as European history. Yeah. But the concern here is that you're seeing one side. You're seeing one side that's basically being paraded, being sort of glorified, if you will. And that's the argument, whereas the other side just, they're there. Yeah, and it really depends on uh, the, I mean, there's a mix of who wants these schools. There are those who are just looking for any way to help out uh, children who aren't learning. Mm -hmm. And there are others who are, are much more uh, ideological about it, who think that, you know, logic is just one way of thinking. Well, it's not just one way mm -hmm. of thinking, it's a better way of thinking. The fact that it came from the Greeks is largely irrelevant, and the, and the, and the fact that it uh, came from uh, the Greeks doesn't mean that if you're Greek, you're going to be more logical. Mm -hmm. We have to teach what's good in humanity, not what's good from the Greeks because it was Greek or from the Europeans because it was European. It's irrelevant. If someone invented a, a rocket ship, it doesn't matter that he was Scottish or African or whatever. So we should incorporate what we see in history we should be and include. Yeah, we should be teaching yes. children to identify what is finest in what the human mind can produce by applying their own rational thought to each problem saying this is more valuable than that. Not because 
well, you know, this is the way we've always done it, or this is the mm -hmm. same color as mine, but this is what in, will be a value to my life. Do you think we need life. to revamp the curriculum? I think in all schools we mm -hmm. need to revamp the curriculum, get away from teaching tradition and et cetera, and focus on how to think properly, yeah. how to value Oh, I, I, I second that, how to think properly. I mean, it's a lost art. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about this, Anthony? Well, I mean, it's it's such a complex issue in terms of where do we where do you begin? I mean, if if you're looking at it from an anthropological um, view of of the evolution of, of humankind, you could probably trace it back to um, thought patterns originated in continental African regions. They went through um, the South Asian regions through Ayurvedic traditions. Then they, um, they they siphoned off into some of the longer Chinese traditions before they ever hit the Greek and, and Roman traditions. So. Um, so we, we've basically bypassed, you know, hundreds of, of, of years, centuries that predated even, you know, the 500 AD of, of the Greeks and the Romans, um, on which most a lot of our society is based. So I think, but whenever, whenever you you take a label and you you specifically target or segment one ethnic ethnic um, group or, or one or one racial group like black focused or Af afrocentric you, and you do that over a base of public tax dollars you're creating a very slippery slope it's no different than the faith-based schools debate um, what, what do we you know maybe we should have Italian focused schools or maybe we should have mm -hmm. South Asian focused schools or, or Chinese focused schools so wh what are we really talking about the fact is we have an implicit problem with learning um, in um, in, in the Toronto area is why this debate is coming up. And and 40% mm -hmm. of young black men in specific are not graduating. Not 40% of young black hmm. women or young girls. It, yes. it, so so we need to say, wait a minute, so is the solution, is, why is the solution um, uh, not catering towards the black males as a, because because the, the, the statistic is, is, is more mm -hmm. representative of the young black men. So. We need to look at some of, of the other uh, factors that are contributing to this debate and not just say, wait a minute, it's a panacea um, uh, because, because what, what, it, what you're doing is you're creating a division, you're using semantics, and I think we're using a smokescreen. I think racism is a big part of it. I, I think, think so I, I think I, I think, think so um, uh, racial profiling by teachers. We, we, we sit here and bash cops in our society, uh, a lot of people, uh, for racial profiling, but I can assure you that there's, the Ontario Human Rights Commission released a report in 2005 that blatantly states there's profiling against um, visible minorities in our school system in Ontario and against children with disabilities. And yet mm -hmm. none of that has ever, has, that, that, that it was a flash in the pan report and it's never been addressed since. Okay, I, I understand this whole, I, I think what the two of you are saying makes more sense than what I've seen in a lot of these articles that seem to only address it from a surface point of view. For instance, when it first came out, this was the argument I heard. Well, it brings us back to segregation. That's what they had way before the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King will be rolling in his grave. Well, it's a bit simplistic on that note alone, simply because when you look at segregation back then, it was a forced segregation. The blacks did not want to be by themselves. They were basically rejected by the whites, period. A very different scenario. But when I see the stats, for instance, in Nova Scotia, uh, some, some, uh, some fellow here, Mr. Fells, in this article that spearheaded an Afrocentric school there, talks about a 4% graduation rate from high school. When he started this Afrocentric school, it went to 90%. It seems like from the evidence presented, it's working. But I must tell you, I'm not comfortable with this whole Afrocentric thing. So I wonder. Could it be an idea? Because this is also being looked at as well, that you incorporate that kind of education in the current system. St and to what, le to what level Statistics do you do it? are a funny thing. I'm a statistician. And, and, yes. And, and, yes. And, and, you know, and you can do a lot with statistics. Um, and, and, and oftentimes, it's not the statistic, but the story behind the statistic. It's, it's always right. that. And, 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 <laughs> yes. and so, and so, so you, we need to know a lot more than, than just uh -huh. saying that, because I think in terms of what his success was, um, we know, you take something like the Hawthorne, effect where if you take um, a group of kids yes. and give them special consideration they're gonna do better just because, because they're they better they, they, think they're they're yeah. they think they're worth it now, may, now maybe if you take if you took we, um, we did a, a program in North uh, East Toronto in, the, in Malvern where we took eight uh, young black men who had been uh, unjustly uh, labeled as developmentally delayed by the Toronto District School Board we put them into a transitioning program um, in um, with the support of the Toronto Catholic Board and those young men who were all <laughs> proud D&E students, you know, 
were scoring 80, 90, and 100% in their math scores. It was mm. so powerful that, of course, Alan King, the filmmaker, did a documentary that was featured in the film festival in 2006 about the success of these young men. Well, you know, when, when these young men were able to get this, this alternative curriculum, which what included Mensa problems, and they were doing it, well, it was, it, what was part of the success? Well, there was only eight. They, we had mm -hmm. one teacher, we had about four teaching aides, giving them all kinds of support, to, to do it. So when they had the support, when they had a smaller uh, cohort to, to learn. It takes it, a lot it, of resources to do this though. But possibly, but, it, but again, but then with resources, aren't we about equity? Aren't we about like, this is part of our accessibility, um, you know, trying to make things accessible um, in our society. And, and so, so I think, but in terms of if we have, now when you have a class with 30 kids and, and you know, maybe you have three or four who are disruptive, well, it's a lot, and, and, the t and, and the classroom size is too big. It's very difficult for the teacher to cater to the, you know, three or four who are disruptive. So it's easier to send them to the office and get them in trouble and get them expelled. So they don't graduate, you know. But, but again, what's it really about? And, and, and at the end of the day, I think we need to look at... There are deep social issues, though, yeah. affecting the, if you want to put it, the, the, the African community or roots, if we're looking at, particularly in Toronto. We saw the report that came out, a thousand-page report, that there's a serious problem there with violence. There is a problem. I mean, some say they're not the problem, that perhaps it's society, it's racism. You hear people saying as well that you've got a large segment of this population that their dad isn't even present. I mean, there are issues here that I still think we need to address, and I'm not sure that the Afrocentric schools is necessarily the answers, but we're going to be talking more about it. We also want to hear if you're in agreement with Afrocentric schools. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned. Hello again. Welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're continuing to talk about the proposal from the Toronto School Board in Afrocentric schools. We want to hear what your viewpoint is. Call in at any time. Let's go now to Lizzie on line five. Hi, Lizzie, you're on the line. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, my comment is, is that I think that we need to keep the uh, history in all schools and for each, everybody to learn everybody else's culture so that we all come from there and understand it. I think separating doesn't help everybody. I think that's the problem that a lot of people don't understand each other's culture. Mm -hmm. And I think if we understood it a little bit more, that it would help that. I work in a multicultural um, jo uh, job where I have to learn everybody else's religion, and mm -hmm. I think it helps me to respect their, their. Yes. Lizzie, you got a good point. How would you receive this? Or would you perhaps have certain stipulations here? When you get into other people's culture, when you get into history, let's, let's face it, facts are endless. How do you go about picking and choosing what you put in a curriculum so that different groups, perhaps those who most need it, can be pleased, can be, can feel as if, well, wait a minute here, my legitimate history is being recognized. Well, I think that's a mistake. I, you know, my legitimate history is the first mistake in the whole mm -hmm. thing. It's all of our history. Well, everybody's history is legitimate. The, the reason I said so is because you've got to pick and choose. Right. So how do you go about picking and choosing? I, I, I think what you do is you say, look, this isn't the history of the blacks or the whites or the Greeks or the Romans. This is mm -hmm. the history of humanity. And what we're here in this classroom to do is to say, what out of all of human history is the, the valuable, the stuff we want to mm -hmm. keep? And you that's know, what makes it legitimate. That's right. I mean, the, the, in art, for example, uh, there's a, a joke by one of my favorite uh, authors. She says, once you've seen one group of people clapping hands and jumping up and down, you've seen them all. And I, I looked on the internet and I saw literally dozens of paintings of people in a circle dancing and jumping up and down. And I thought, she's absolutely right. There's absolutely nothing innovative or value adding to this. It's just another folk drawing. And what she's saying is, look at art, try to identify what's valuable in art, and everyone, regardless of color, should be able to do that regardless of the source of the art. In other words, whether you're black, white, or whatever, you should be able to look at any, any piece of art and say, mm -hmm. now that's good art or that's bad art, regardless of whether it's You know my what? Art you're not going to get an argument from me, Paul, on that particular model. I, I think it's, it's fantastic, but you got a problem in Toronto, and that's recognized, which is why this was proposed in the first place. You've yeah. got a serious problem with violence, with kids dropping out. We know that a little while ago, with the, um, the zero tolerance policy on violence, um, the NDP came out and said it was a gang recruitment act. It seems to constantly point and identify one particular group, the, the gangs, and, and we know what we're talking about here, hence the Afro-centric um, schools. We're not going to be politically correct. That's the issue here, which is why we're looking at this as a possibility. My question to you is, 
with the problem we have at hand. We want to see what's best for these kids. A kid doesn't choose to be born and say, look, um, I choose not to have my dad or to have a ghost dad in the picture or a deadbeat dad. It's something that's happening. We've got a problem on our hands in the Toronto School Board. How do you handle it? Well, I'm, I, don't, I don't claim to be a teacher, but one thing... No, you, but just, just common yeah, sense here, from a thing, politics point of view. Sure. Well, one thing you don't do is assume that, you know, you think differently if you have a different color of skin. We're all human beings. We all process information. But with unique needs, with unique needs according to group. Well, I, uh, mm -hmm. what, depending on what your group, I mean, if you're talking to someone who's mentally challenged, that's a different matter. But if you're just saying, well, my skin's darker than your skin, I don't think that skin color is a need. I think that morality might be a need. Maybe somebody huge, who's completely huge. messed up. Issue. That means every child, regardless of skin color, should be taught, you know, how to live a, a fruitful, mm -hmm. happy, peaceful life. And that's, that's information that's not just relevant to people who are having a hard time, but to yes. people who are having a good, you know. So if we're teaching these things properly, then every school will be an appropriate school for every uh, mm -hmm. child. If, mm -hmm. if, on the other hand, we're saying, well, you know, uh, this is just a different way of behaving, well, there, there are better ways of behaving and worse ways. And until we're willing to say that, we're going to be we're going to be setting up little balkanized mm -hmm. tribes of schools uh, where the you know the the blue-eyed white kids are going to say, well, we have our history and and we can only learn in a blue-eyed mm -hmm. white school. Yes. And how come they're getting more funding in the black school than in the white school? And we can all start fighting about funding and who's got more and then it can be a nice racial war and we can all turn ourselves into the Balkans. So it's a horrible approach to, to, to uh, divide people according to race. Race is the most irrelevant thing in human history. Consider mm -hmm. what's valuable for all humanity, that is the rational mind. Teach kids to respect rationality and morality and it won't I, matter what I the agree. color of their skin. I, I hear you. You know, Anthony. You know, I, I think that when, we're, when you're addressing the issue of Afrocentric or black focused yes. schools, you need to say, why are we even talking about this? The whole reason why uh, this topic has come in, into the, in the public forum is because of social problems that are occurring. Of course. The social problems that are occurring is that 40% of young black males Precisely. are not graduating mm -hmm. um, from high schools so in fix the GTA. This is a very local and specific mm -hmm. issue. Um, now there are other local specific issues that occur with Aboriginal populations um, course, in, in Canada as well. And so we'd have to look at those and, and say, but well, wait a minute, they're in Aboriginal populations um, in, on, on reserves and so forth, and they're, they're having barriers oh, there. Oh, it's not 70% of them are actually outside of the reserve and, and no. integrated, which a lot of people don't even realize. Yeah, yes. so, but the people who are in the reserve are themselves facing barriers of not finishing schools, mm -hmm. okay? So, and I think the, those, um, the, the, the statistics are higher for those who are not finishing schools when they're in their marginalized areas. So we're not even talking about that in terms of, but for some reason this, the 40% the Well, not it's a violence students. issue as well. I uh, mean, that, that is part of this. I mean, this has been ongoing. So how do we fix it? I mean, you, and, yes, go ahead. Well, no, and I, I think part of it is, is we need to look at, well, what are the, the causes of a problem. I mean, you know, you talk about a logic model. We need to go back and say, wait, what are the underlying causes that have got us to this place? I mean, um, you family, family breakdown, alienation, yep. racism is an issue as lack well. Lack of morality. That's right. You, um, you know, and I, I think, you know, and, and we could say, well, you know, lack of role models or precisely or, or, you know, all of them. But all you of know, there, but I think that you know, um, what we need to do is we need to say, look, the people who are in the positions of um, leadership, whether it be teachers or community leaders or of politicians need to be very transparent of how they are addressing um, what we're, we're, we're dealing with. This is not a curriculum issue, right? We're, ta we're, we're, we're saying, well, if we, you know, if we just have, have a more, we're, we're gonna solve a social mm -hmm. problem by having a curriculum-based issue. Having, you know, maybe some, some teachers who have more black teachers. Well, you know, I, I can assure you that the people who made the difference in my life were predominantly white. Mm -hmm. Okay, the mm -hmm. people who impacted me, who assisted me, the professors who were my mentors, who helped me, the people who gave me a step up in business, the, the one man, Fred Lepkin and Burnaby South High School in grade 11 and 12, who made that impact in my life and helped take a, a, a kid who was going in 180 um, degrees in the wrong direction and changed my life, was a, mm. was an, <laughs> an obese, sorry Fred, uh, you know, white Jewish man. 
So, and, and, and how did he teach me to, to read and become passionate about learning? Through Bob, Deer, Bob Dylan lyrics, through um, Bob Marley lyrics, through all kinds of the po- lyrics from the police. And, and that's how, you know, through music lyrics, I really began to build my vocabulary and, and learn to read and become excited about learning. You were fortunate to have somebody that took you under, under their wing. And a lot of these kids, they don't think anybody cares about them. I mean, that's a huge issue. Let's hear what you on the phone lines have to say. Yolanda on line eight. Hello, you're on the line. Hello. Hello. I just want to share my little problems with the audience. Mm -hmm. I have a son, and he's 17 now. When he just came from the Caribbean, I registered him to a school here, and he was going so good until they started to label him. Then he started to drop back from school, don't want to go in the morning, and he will go to school late. I will get a phone call that he's not coming to school. So, Yolanda, you're saying in short that he suffered racism and this affected him? Yeah, and I... Yolanda, you made, you made a point there. You made a good point there. Because of time constraints, we can't go into a lot of detail, but that issue of racism, and of course, we'll continue to talk more about Afrocentrism and to hear what centric schools and to hear what you have to say on the phone lines after the break. Stay tuned. Hello again, and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're going to go straight to you now on the phone line. Cindy on line five. Hello, Cindy. You're on the line. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I just wanted to make a few points um, in regards to the caller and the gentleman who was speaking. The focus is not on black only. It's only on a black focus. So we're looking at positive black role models and achievements as the basis for our learning. So we're not only looking at segregating, we're looking at bringing, I guess, um, a new dimension into what we learn. Cindy, are you any and part of that process by any chance? Pardon? Are you a part of the process? No, I wish I was, to be honest with you. Um, the other gentleman had said that race is irrelevant. Mm-hmm. I'm a black woman, and I have a BA and an MA. And trust me, nobody can tell me that race is irrelevant because it's still around. And I think that when we have black positive schools, it's about making us feel better of who we are. It's about giving us an anchor so we can be a better part of society. It's not about segregation. Okay, thanks for your call, Cindy. We're going to get, yes, you have something to say about this. Yeah, I just wanted to address that. I mean, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that race isn't taken into account. I'm saying race shouldn't be taken into account. It should be irrelevant. Mm-hmm. And if we don't teach kids that, uh, they won't learn it. If we set them up in schools where they have role models that match their skin color, what we're teaching mm-hmm. them is that race is very relevant and that your achievement, your likelihood of success in the future is based on the, the, the availability of role models from the past. Role models, schmoll models, the, pa- the fact of the matter is every human uh, stands on their own two feet. They either choose to succeed or they choose not to succeed. And the fact that someone of the same color mm-hmm. succeeded or failed is no reflection on you. You know, you got a point there. Um, just to sum it up, we were talking during the break about the whole issue of character education, and you were saying, well, how dare one race see themselves as superior to another? Uh, unfortunately, that's what we're grappling with. I remember once, and I'm trying to sum all this up very quickly, we, we, we've had a guest on, Denise Jones. She said she chose to send her child to a black doctor. I understood this because I think in, there's a reality out there. A, a lot of the black population are under the impression that unless you can play basketball, sports, and I'm not putting that down, or you can, you can entertain people, you're worth nothing. Because generally speaking, the role models in the media that we've seen, and generally speaking, fine, people are used to the image of the Indian doctor, the white doctor, the Asian doctor, but when it comes to the black population... Dr. Huxtable. Well, I, I love Dr. Huxtable, okay? I love Dr. Huxtable. And yes, we have that as a role model. But generally speaking, we don't get enough of that. So I can understand the individual needs of different community members. But I also like that idea about character education that you were saying in the break to be in the schools. Yeah, I think... We all need to learn here. Right. We need to learn that the absence of a doc, Dr. Huxtable doesn't mean that black people can't be doctors. And in fact, mm-hmm. that the, the, the fact that someone in your class happens to be black and that you happen to be white, look, you know, just because your great-grandfather was a president doesn't mean that you're able to be a president. And just because his great-grandfather wasn't a president doesn't mean he won't be the next one. So uh, we have to teach all children of all races, if you want, all human uh, children, let's put it that <laughs> way, <laughs> that uh, they've got to respect every human being as a human being. But what do you do about the Yolandas of the world? That She comes here, her child goes to school, suffers racism. I remember at one point, the Muslim Canadian Congress said, if you want to fix your problem, this was a statement they issued, widespread. If you want to fix the problem of violence, 
than fix the racism problem. It, it's something that cannot be swept under the carpet. There are those who try to do it, but it's there. And you've got people like Yolanda, her child is in the school system, suffering prejudice. So what does that kid do? Develops an anger, goes to a group that has that same anger, and before you know it, you've got an explosion on your hands. You, need, you do need a multi-layered approach in addressing these things. Racism is a problem. That doesn't excuse the no, fact it does that, not excuse. That, that if you are a victim, that you, know, you have no personal responsibility to how you react. You, there's racism, then there's responses to racism. Yes. But just to say we're going we're we're to pursue a, a, an agenda of what I call entitlement to say, you know, I need this because I'm a, it's, I, I'm a, spe I have a specific wrong. case. That is wrong. cannot excuse that's a, that. That's a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Because so just like, oh, you know, you have have to give me this hands up because I'm just so much more disadvantaged than this other person. I think that that's a cop out. You know, I was functionally literate till I was in grade 10. And you know what? I I had a person who was willing to help me, but I you had to step up and though. meet the challenge. You were fortunate. And this Not is something really. you have it. This is no, but you were fortunate in that you had people that went to bat for you. You were at a point in life, and you've said this on air yeah. before, so I'm not revealing any secrets here, yeah. that you pulled a gun on somebody once and right you on felt 15. a sense of, of empowerment yes. when you did that. Absolutely. Because 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 that was the leveling instrument at the time. But when I had a, a man a couple of years later who showed that he cared about me and he did that in 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 a in a very uh, real um, and deep way, then I realized I don't need that because I gained my sense of empowerment. You know, through I, I'm not way. supporting Afrocentric schools, but I'm wondering is that the issue they're trying to deal with here? Well, we're talking Show these children that they care in terms of their background, in terms of their race, but one of the to try to deal with a, a problem education. that we're all facing. I mean, nobody wants to walk down the road and wonder, am I going to be hit by a stray bullet next? Well, you, and you, I, you, I, talked being, about, you talked about yes. character education. Yes, uh, I did. An important component of character education is role modeling. Right? Certainly. It is, it is role modeling. And there, do, there does need to be positive role models. I'll tell you, with, with, in Brampton Neighborhood Resource Center, the president of our board um, is a man of color. And I can tell you that when some of the more challenged youth come in to our facility, and I introduce um, Len Carby as the president of, of our resource center, they meet him and they go, you're the president of this, this, this hmm. incredible organization? Because the, the, and these young men of color see another, this man of color who, who had a history uh, as an administrator for the Montreal Stock Exchange and, and now he, he's an entrepreneur. And, and, and so they see him in this light. And so this really, it's important. And, 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 his, and then his character, in turn, the way he presents himself shows them, wow, this is the way of conduct. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's talk about that for a sec. Yes. What you're saying is that these people who never thought that a person of his uh, genetic mm -hmm. makeup would ever be a president, the problem is that they're surprised. Exactly. They should never be surprised. And they that's the point there. Right. They shouldn't need. In itself. Need, right. In itself. The fact that, that, that a role model helps people to be surprised and break down, that is not so much a cure as mm. a way of, 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 of identifying that, oh my goodness, we've got a problem here. And the problem is, no one should ever have to go through life thinking, well, if I haven't seen one that's the same color as me, I can't be like that. From the get-go, we have to say, even if you've never seen anybody like you do it, you're just as likely as any other hardworking, uh, thinking person to succeed. Do not value your race, whether for the positive or for the negative. It is of no consequence. We should never be saying, wow, look, a green person can do that. Mm -hmm. we, we should be living our whole yes. life as though, sure, maybe yes. a pers purple person but will too. we're not there yet, and I think, and we're, I not think we're not there yet, and I think in the interim. Look, Martin Luther King is a role model mm -hmm. to all people. Um, Gandhi was a role model to all people. Whether you know, we're going to have to get you to hold that thought, Anthony, because we must go for a break now. We'll be back to you on the phone lines after this. Stay tuned. Hello again, and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Wow, time goes on pretty quick. Today we're talking about a sensitive subject right now, Afrocentric schools. Many of you are waiting on the phone lines, so we're going to get to you. We're going to ask that you make your comment as short as you can so that we can get to all of you. Let's go now to Antoinette on line six. Hello, you're on the line. Hello, Christine and guests. Yep, we're here. Yes, I'm for Afrocentric schools, and that is, this is the reason. If other races can have their own schools, so can um, uh, the, the black people, because that is a way of teaching our kids to know about more about their culture and to educate them that they can be something terrific in life, because the white schools or other schools can't teach them that. First of all, they don't have black history in school. They don't teach them those things. They don't teach the culture. So why not an Afrocentric school? Okay, so you're not talking about white schools as such. You're talking about curriculums that base the history on the European culture. Is this what you're referring to? Because when you look at Toronto schools, they're very multicultural. 
They don't teach anything to the so black kids about, about the history. You're talking about the curriculum. It's, it's, all, it's all about white history. Mm -hmm. Let's teach them what they need to know. Antoinette, thanks for your comment. Let's go now to Tamara on line eight. Hello, Tamara. You're on the line. Uh, hello, Christine and yeah. guests. I am a Holocaust survivor, and I'm going to schools and teaching the children not to bully, teach the children to respect each other and to respect each other's race and religious orientation. Tamara, good for you. Please send me a personal email, okay, Tamara? I'm going to be looking for that one. Thanks for calling. Let's go now to Dan on line five. Hello, Dan. You're on the line. Hi. I'm a black male myself, and I'm not in support of Afrocentric schools. Two things. I have a two daughters, a four- and an eight-year-old daughter, and my two daughters go into a Catholic school. They're the only two black daughters and a uh, child in, in the Catholic school. My daughter came home and said that I want to be white. Comb my hair like a white child. No, I think that's the problem because of the Catholic school is segregated, and if you're not Catholic, therefore you cannot go there. A lot of black parents are not Catholic, so therefore their kids are not going, and so are other races. Now, if we have um, uh, Afrocentric Afro schools, which would uh, mainly consist of blacks, then the white child or the Chinese child that's attending that school probably will have the same problem because asking questions that are hard to, uh, to answer. Dan, <laughs> thank you for your call. Let's go now to Marie on line one. Hello, Marie. You're on the line. Go ahead, Marie. Hello. Hello, Marie. You're on the line. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. I just want to say um, I'm from the Caribbean, and I have a son in school. Uh, when he came here to Canada and started going to school here, his first question was like, um, Mom, are there any black persons on or team players on the hockey team? Mm -hmm. Right. He started to enjoy hockey, and he was watching hockey and all that. And that was his first question. His second question was, like, we started going to the Mandarin uh, restaurant, and his third visit, he said, why aren't there any black persons in this restaurant? Mm -hmm. And his other issue was that when he joined that first school, we were living in a Jewish neighborhood, and he loved soccer. Mm -hmm. And he came home, and he was crying, and he said, Mom, these boys won't let me play with them. I said, you know, you're, you're new, so, you know, you'll get to know them later on. Marie, where do you stand on the Afrocentric schools? I'm sorry? Where do you stand on that issue? Are you in support uh, for them? At first, I, I, I was kind of against it, but now I'm it? starting to think that it, probably we should have Marie, thank you for your call. We're running along in time here. Let's go now to Lena on line seven. Hello, Lena. You're on the line. Go ahead, Lena. Let's go to Chantel on line six. Hello, Chantel. You're on the line. Hello. Hello, Chantel. Go ahead. I just wanted to know. I hear, like, all you guys are talking about what you guys think is right or what, what, what adults think is I'm appropriate. hearing what you think is right. That's why you're calling in, Chantel. Let's hear it. I want to know who's surveying the youth to ask them what they think about Afrocentric schools mm -hmm. and Good. how they feel about this. Yes. Good question. Yeah, now, you work a lot with you. And, and, and that's what I said. I, I, I was on yes, with Michael Enright, uh, and it'll be on CBC uh -huh. on Sunday mornings. But it, it, the thing is, that's what I said. We, we, he, Michael Enright said to me, what, how are we going to address this? And I said, we need to ask the kids. And that's what I do. And I will tell you, Christine, I spent half of my early years from uh, kindergarten to grade 12, half being the only person of color in a classroom. Mm. And, and there was a couple of years where I was the only person of color in my school growing up in Vancouver. And so I, and I can assure you that hockey is my favorite sport. And I'll, uh, the first time I ever saw Grant Fear play, mm -hmm. I was really happy to see a person of color actually on the ice. But I, I, I still played hockey. Um, I still struggled through the f fact that everybody was white and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. But for me, if somebody said to me, well, you know, do you want more people who look like you, is that going to solve the problem? No. What but was going to solve you, the problem? What do you think the kids would say? I mean, kids really differ when it comes kids, to that. If you're a kid that maybe you're bitter, um, and I'm talking any respect. color kid, they, you might tend to segregate and go with your own. And I'm not talking necessarily one race here. Right. You've got a lot of segregation going on, period. Some I, schools, it's the Muslim kids that stick together, and they want to. So you ask them, what do they want? They'll say, sure, I want to stick together with my group. Or you have a school that maybe the white kids stick together. Oh, it's great. Let them have their school. I want to be together in my white group. I'm talking about when you see a situation with segregation among youth, they're going to probably say, I'm for it. But okay. is it the best thing? I'm not sure. I think absolutely not. I think that's a perfect example. I think we're born with these sort of tribalist instincts. You know, I hang we with flock. the white guy. Yeah, we, we flock. flock. <laughs> and that's what we as adults owe to the children. Mm -hmm. The lesson that 
tribalism, these, this collectivist idea, this racist, yeah. inherently racist yeah. idea is wrong, it's lowly, it's for the stupid, the, the, those I, I who, like who are unwilling I, to think. I like that. And that these children need to learn to look beyond these concrete irrelevancies. Like he wears a red shirt and I wear a blue one. Irrelevant. He's white skin, I'm black. Irrelevant. What's yep. relevant is, is, does this person have a good character? Do they, are, they, are they a person I can trust and rely on? We need yes. to teach them what is valuable in a human being and what is irrelevant. And I, but I, but, but I think also you have to look at what the first caller who called in, her, her concern is, well, there are, you know, we need to have schools that can teach this. Well, there is an Afrocentric school in Toronto, first of all. It's a private one. And I'm all for a private school of any kind, whether it be a Jewish you know one what? or Anthony, a... Anthony, I like that point you're making. We're just short on time, but I like that point. That's another point, food for thought. Now, we're going to have to go for a break now. I mean, most of our time got eaten up for good reason on this issue, but there's another issue that we want to talk about. Imagine a Spanish man stopped by the cops for impaired driving. No interpreter present. The judge eventually rules. Well, the charges are thrown out. We want to hear what you think about that as well. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Get a hold of this issue. No interpreter, DUI charges dropped. Judge dismisses charge because of no interpreter, as you see upon your screen. The guy was stopped by a cop for an erratic turn. The cop smelled the alcohol on his breath. He was subsequently charged with impaired driving. His lawyer argues, well, there was no interpreter present. This was in the middle of the night there. You can get an interpreter anytime. When you look at the reality of this situation, we live in a multicultural society. I worked in a cop shop for four years. I went to the traffic department. I understand the burden on these guys. Drunk driving is a huge issue. The logistics of getting an interpreter in the middle of the night for everybody who claims they speak broken English or they can't understand. In this particular case, the cop says, the guy seemed to understand English just fine. It was a bit clumsy, if you want to put it that way, but he understood exactly what was being said. And I know for a fact that there are many people out there, they'll use whatever resources they can to beat a charge. Well, I can't talk English. What is this judge thinking? Drunk, dri drunk driving is a bigger social problem than gun no, violence. No, no kidding. It'll kill people. It kills people. <laughs> and, 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 it kills and, and, people. And I think that any this person... This judge is a disaster Any here. person who, who receives their... Driving is, is, is a privilege. It's not a right in our society. Yes. And ignorance is not an excuse of the no, law. That's and, true. And, and for us to, to even bring in our, our constitution to protect this guy in terms of his rights were violated because you know he, well, he, he broke a lie, made an illegal turn. Um, and, 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 and the fact that he was drinking or not, that's... That's just something, but uh, but the question is, why is he, he why was he even given a license in the first place if he's if, if he's going Good to point. be creating two uh, you know um, things and wrong things in, in one little incident? I'm not sure what this judge was thinking. Yeah, I I, don't, I haven't read the specifics. I didn't. I wasn't there. I didn't you know go over the evidence. So I always hesitate to be double double you know guess the judge in particular. Yeah, but you're a lawyer. So yeah, you have I to mean, be careful. I, I mean, careful. you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna take Can West New Service at face value. That's you're correct. <laughs> but, I understand. But you know, the, as a starting point, I would say you know. If you're if you're if you speak enough English to say you know uh, double jack on the rocks, you've probably got enough English to say I would like a lawyer. Uh -huh. And so got, you know, got a point. You know what I mean? And and in the ad, if if the or sorry in the article, if the article's a, a correct reflection of the facts, even the judge in that case said he wasn't convinced that this guy Imagine didn't know that. English. You Imagine know? that. Now and the other thing is that I can understand throwing out, um, for example, a confession if the person didn't know he had a right to silence and he would have known had he had a lawyer. However, I don't think it follows that, uh, you know, a person, when you can smell the alcohol, um, that all the evidence should be thrown out or that the charge should mm -hmm. be thrown out. Okay, maybe, maybe we don't uh, take any testimony that he may have given because he didn't understand he had a right to a lawyer, but I don't think mm -hmm. that means you throw out the breathalyzer and you let the guy go. I'm not sure if that's what happened here, but uh, as again, I'm just talking in, in general, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, again, we're, we're bound by the, the decisions of our Supreme Court of Canada and our courts of appeal in terms of when we should be using mm -hmm. these, um, these dismissals or the, the uh, removal of evidence from consideration. When we do these things, sometimes we do it just so that the state doesn't start trampling over process, right, so that it right. doesn't start violating process. So, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure how egregious it was in this case. It sounds to me like this is one where it, at least it could have gone either way, and that's why it's newsworthy, Yes. Uh, right? Well, actually, this is what the guy said to the cop. No, no, 
I not drink nothing, okay? The cop said he could understand English, he was speaking a bit clumsy, but he understood it. Right. And he agreed to take a breathalyzer. So he took the breathalyzer, failed it, was subsequently charged, and then all of a sudden, he gets off saying, I don't speak English. Yeah. I. Well, again, I mean, the, the, the guy lied. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think so, too, uh, you know, and, based and, and, on what's and, here. And, the, and I think the judge even <laughs> saw that he, he, he probably was questioning the guy's um, truthfulness to the police officer. But I think what the judge did here is he made his decision and let a guy go, I think, more to change police behavior. And I think, and so he, so I, there was real no reason for, he should have still upheld the charge against the man and perhaps reprimanded the police and said you need to be more cautious in your advice you know and he because judges have that kind well, of the leniency guy, the cop was talking to the guy the guy was spoken yeah. speaking broken english he agreed to a breathalyzer i i can't see what else the cop could have done yeah I think you I, know, I can't see what else. You're right. I mean, and these yeah. cases all are going to boil down to the facts. The judge has to listen to the testimony and decide whether or not the uh, officer, for example, uh, re heard something that indicated or saw something that indicated this person did or did not understand the English lang language well enough that an interpreter was not required. So well, the other but, option is we have an interpreter walking around with every single cop in the country. Wow, think of the cost of that. We're yeah. going to go for a break now. We'll be back after this. Stay tuned. I was actually. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're continuing to talk about that case with the Spanish man. He has an accent, according to the cop here, had an accent but could understand English. The judge throws out his drunk driving charge saying there wasn't an interpreter present when the cop stopped him in the middle of the night. That's what we're talking about here. Now, we've told you, the viewer, that any comment you want to say today on any of the topics, go ahead and say so. Our time's running out quickly. We're not going to get to that third topic. Many times that happens because there's too much hate generated over one topic. And we're going to go back to you on the phone lines now and hear what you have to say. Jason on line eight. Hello, Jason. You're on the line. Hi there. Um, my name's Jason. I, I moved up from Newfoundland to Toronto. Um, when I was 12 years old, and I moved to uh, Jane and Finch, and I lived in Toronto for 20 years, and I went to a predominantly, uh, we had 67 different races in our school, and I loved it. I'm a white guy, <laughs> and basically I loved learning about all the different other peoples that were in this school, and I think that if we tear down the multicultural system mm -hmm. and go back to a separated system, we're not going to learn any more about each other, and I think that's just wrong. Like I said, I loved learning about Jamaican, African Pakistani, um, you know, all the different people that were there, and I thought it was just beautiful. Well, Jason, thanks for calling in. The world's a better place because of people like you. Keep it up. Let's go now to Pat on line one. Hello, Pat, you're on the line. Let's go to Kate on line five. Hello, Kate, you're on the line. Go ahead, Kate. Having problems. Let's try Candy on line six. Hello, Candy, you're on the line. Uh, hello, my name is Candy, and mm -hmm. I'm a black uh, lady, and I don't believe that having a black school will solve all the problems because I believe there is a lot of black mothers out there that don't want to send their children to an all-black school. Yes. Well taken, Candy. Let's go now to Frank on line seven. Hello, Frank. You're on the line. You know, Cand Candy's got a point herself. I mean, we're hearing where the viewers point of view is. Obviously, this is a very heated topic we discussed today. Yeah. People want to talk well, about it for a reason. Both of these topics are connected if you really well, think about it. Well, they're very Because one is about, should language be more accessible? The other one is, should uh, more cultural sensitivity and education yes. be more accessible? Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about issues of accessibility. But I think what we need to really talk about is just issues of sensitivity and, and issues of, I've heard um, him mention this several times, reason, right? We, we need to look at what, what does it mean to be reasonably functional in our society and how do we respond to that? And we can't be shifting the blame anytime something goes wrong in our own lives or, or with no, us to, 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 to no, try and expect you know, our, our society to fix it. Right? I want to so, be clear on something here. I, I make no excuses for people who choose to, for example, pull out a gun and shoot somebody. But I also realize that when you're dealing with youth in particular, they're very retrievable. They're young, basically they're reacting. I mean, everybody knows how youth are. They react largely out of emotion. They're reacting to their surroundings. There's got to be a solution here. Well, you know, one of the things that we're doing in our center, and I, I mentioned this, you know, we have some young men who've had problems in their lives, and they've now come in and they're becoming youth leaders in, our, in the programs in our center. And we started this program called the Youth Educating Against Hate, where what we're talking about is love. We're talking about... Well, you're in the Toronto Sun here, yeah, article yeah, I have here. Yeah, and we're, we're talking about using things like love and peace and character mm -hmm. to to help address 
uh, whatever it is that are challenging us. And I think once we get to those levels of discourse, it shouldn't be about NAFO-centric or, or getting no, language. I, I to, to we, we, we have to be talking about what does it mean, how do we treat each Anthony, other. Anthony, we're out of time. And Paul, the two of you brought some really great points to the table. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Frank. And that's all the time we have. See you again next time. We'll be talking about issues facing women of Islam. I'm Christine Williams. And from all of us, thank you for watching.